Hello, I'm Nick. <laughs> and this is Judy. A.K.A. Lux. And Ember. And this is our thoughts on, wait for it, Zootopia. Yes, I know you had to wait for it. <laughs> it took us a while. Uh, I watched it in theaters with my mom. Mostly fun experience. I'll give some details. <laughs> I was really interested in the movie, and then I got spoiled on a major plot point, and I had to wait like a year to cool down. And then one of our friends at one of the cons we go to was like, I want to tell you all about this, but you haven't seen it. And we basically said, yeah, yeah, we'll see it by next year. We're going to be meeting this friend in a little bit, like a couple of days. So. <laughs> so I kind of didn't have a choice. <laughs> So as usual, we're like, hey, we're going to be talking about this thing anyways. Let's record it. <laughs> uh, so since you've seen it more recently than I, please start with you. <laughs> All right. Good movie. I know we're going to get slaughtered if we don't say that right off the bat. Also, I know it's been out for a while, but just to be in this save site, spoilers. I know. Just heads up. Considering that I hadn't watched it and... You know, I actually wanted to see the movie. There could still be people out there. So, it's a good movie. Gorgeous visuals, such attention to detail with really giving an idea of different architecture, different zones, different landscapes. Actually taking the time to figure out how would an anthropomorphic giraffe pick up their drink order? How would a hippo come to work and not be soaking wet in his suit. I know, it's all over the place. Everything from the trains, to the buildings, to city sectors. You can tell what animals group in that area by the way the buildings are designed. Like, if there's mostly cats, you can tell it's mostly cats because of the way the buildings are designed. If it's camels, you can tell because of the way the buildings are designed, or the streets, or the structures. Into where jungle animals live. They put attention into how the mechanisms of the world work. Like the desert is right next to the ice zone. I know that seems crazy, but the way heating and cooling system works, it makes sense because you're taking the heat that's being pulled out of the ice zone and pushing it into the desert zone. So you're actually reducing your power usage by doing that. Amazing stuff. And Nibber's looking at me right now like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, it was very amazing. I didn't think about the desert zone being next to the ice zone. But it makes sense in how cooling and heating technology works, because you're actually just removing heat from one zone to another. This is why you stand next to your refrigerator, you get warm. Because guess where the heat from inside the refrigerator is going? It's being extracted out, and it has to go somewhere. You know, because energy doesn't disappear, it just gets changed. Science class, yay. And... You know, really cute, the introduction with the little stage play to give us a quick once-over of, yeah, we don't do that anymore. And wasn't it really nice how they transitioned from realistic to stage play? Very enjoyable. I mean, if you were going into the movie totally blind, you'd be going, what the heck? And they capture parents wincing at their kids' stage play so well in that scene. Because <laughs> Judy's parents are like, ugh! <laughs> like, no, no, honey, honey, yeah, that's a nice dream. The important thing is to take that dream and then never believe in it. Wow, way to be supportive parents, Mr. and Mrs. Hops. Yeah, the way her parents are, it's, it's so good. <laughs> it's so real. And it's amazing how, like, all of what we see in Zootopia, like, came together in the last year or year and a half of production because we're heading a completely different direction from most of the production of Zootopia and then they went hmm yeah that's that's really not gonna work let's go over here and focus on Judy yeah that's better because <laughs> was originally supposed to be focused on Nick and these collars around predators that would shock them if they did anything predator like it was about how Nick would build this big club where predators could be themselves and just have fun. I can't really comment because Lux is the one who looked into that part, not me. Well, it was also on the special features, and if you look up some of the videos on YouTube that actually came from the special features. It was enough that I finally got to watch the movie. I haven't gone through special features and analysis videos and behind-the-scenes stuff. 
I'm just glad she liked it. Because <laughs> sometimes I like a movie so much, I'm like, oh, Ember's gonna love this. Show it to her. I absolutely hate this. Why did you make me watch it? <laughs> I thought you would enjoy it. What of any of this made you think that I would like this? I thought you knew me better than that. Cough. Equestria Girls. Cough. Rainbow Rocks. <laughs> that one I was a little bit more like, she may like this one because I think it's okay. <laughs> yes, but back to Disney slash Pixar. Yeah, because this was made after the whole absorption thing where like Disney bought Pixar and Pixar became Disney and... Yeah, and John Lasseter was involved with the film. Enough said. Though I've heard bad things about John Lasseter recently. Yes, but that was recently. Back at this point when this movie was made, John Lasseter being involved basically meant Pixar. And the way this movie sets things up is really good. Like the whole conflict between Judy and the bully, Gideon, sets up conflicts in the future and resolutions in the future and it sets up a great payoff at the end where Judy gets a true I'm sorry from Gideon which allows her to go back and say I'm sorry to Nick even though she probably felt it she didn't know how to express it and Gideon gave her that and not only that wait a minute those do what now bye <laughs> but back to the beginning of the movie <laughs> Yeah, so we also get a nice setup of proving that Judy is not the typical timid bunny. Because not only did she take on Gideon, she stood up to Gideon, got the tickets back, 15 years later, went through police academy training, and even though she kept failing 50 million times, she kept at it. Like they keep saying, she doesn't know when to quit. Nope. And then she gets meter maid duty. Yes. She's like, I'm not going to write 100 tickets. I'm going to write 200. And just what we see and how they point out different animal abilities. Her hearing's amazing. She could hear the second those meters went off. Mm. And just going backwards a moment to the bullpen, which I believe that's the actual name that you commonly use for the police dispatch room. But for it actually to be led by a bull... And all the animal jokes that they fit in that are the stereotypical ones, but they do it with a lighter hand. Like, okay, everybody, it's time to acknowledge the elephant in the room. <laughs> it's his birthday! <laughs> I believe that's what it was. It was a birthday, but normally acknowledging the elephant in the room is to talk about an uncomfortable subject that everyone can see is there, but nobody wants to discuss. And then you have... The lemmings, you know, going in a line and being easily swayed. You have Judy's little dig of, well, you know, us bunnies are good at multiplication. Yeah, they slide in those animal jokes and puns like, wait a minute, did that? There was a pun there. They don't, like, slap you in the face with it. It's just there. Like, it's normal everyday thing in this world. That's another thing. They, they make it so it's like, this is a real world. This is normal in that world. And they write it in such a way that you're like comfortable with it. So you don't pick up on that. It's like a it's not like a whack in your face like a usual pun is. It's just there. It's like when someone slips in a really good pun in the conversation, you go, ah. Yeah, it's not over the top. So it really overall makes the film feel more believable because it's not so heavy handed with the jokes. Little Heavy on tolerance and small-mindedness, and since we're dealing with species here and predator versus prey, I'm just going to say isms to take Ferris Bueller. We're, we're talking about isms. And what's really interesting about this film is because of the production time, a lot of the stuff was actually written, composed, and put together before a lot of the real bad race stuff started happening. It just happened to come out when all that stuff started piling up in the news. I'm not going to go into specifics, but look up the time period when Zootopia came out and what was going on with the police. That's all I'm saying. We try not to be too heavy-handed here either, so. But a simple Google search will bring it up for you. It just happened to land in that time period. So I think it was actually a good slap in the face for the public. Like, oh, yeah. 
Because sometimes you have to see something taken to the extreme for it to jolt enough of, oh. And I like how they introduce Nick. It is a bit cringeworthy because the audience right off the bat goes, I smell a con man. Though, Ember picked up on something I didn't the first time through. Yes, as soon as I saw Nick's accomplice, I went, that is not a child. That is a different species of fox. I've bit on artwork of that species of fox. <laughs> of course he would be smaller than the red fox and have larger ears. That's what that species of fox looks like. And I knew he was an accomplice, but I thought he may have been a young kid accomplice, because, you know, those are a dime a dozen in movies like this. But nope, full-grown adult. <laughs> though, even though it was unsanitary, the stuff they did was pretty creative to turn those things into popsicles. Yes, but going with unsanitary, as soon as I saw the elephant putting together that Sunday, I started cringing. <sighs> the moment I looked at it in the background, I was like, oh, oh god, oh, good thing I did not buy any popcorn with this movie. <laughs> and even better, I didn't buy any ice cream. <laughs> yeah, it's just, that's his nose. <laughs> And I love how that was actually addressed in the film, that it was a health code violation. Mm-hmm. I love how the, right after Judy says that, he just, like, wipes his nose on the apron <laughs> and grabs the scoop. Uh, yeah, and I'm surprised Judy didn't nail him on that, though I do like how she nailed him like Al Capone. Oh, yes, the Al Capone hustle was awesome. But that's the thing, is all the things Judy tried to get Nick on, on her first try, Nick had the permit. You know, he didn't falsely advertise. It was red, wood, with a space. But she saw the other fox making the holes in the snow with his paws. How could she not manage to nail Nick on an unsanitary food preparation? Not just that, but melting the popsicle on the roof. The popsicle liquid was going over the roof. Those are not sanitary conditions. Even if the roof may have been sanitary from the sun, the drain pipe that the juice went through probably was not. So nitpick there because that was where she could have totally gotten him, especially since she called the shop owner on a health violation. So she obviously knows health codes. And misuse of private property. Yes, because that wasn't his house. Nope. But moving on from those nitpicks. <laughs> when is it that she um actually gets taken on to the is it right after nick puts her down is when she ends up getting shanghaied into the case and has a timer on her no that's right after she catches the weasel oh yeah the weasel's next that scene was awesome also is it okay to have leopard print jeggings in a world like this hmm because Mr. Big's daughter, as she's walking out of the mall with her friends, is going, Oh my god, did you see those leopard print jeggings? Wow. Um, like, uh, leopards are actually a thing. So is it okay for different species to wear clothing that is in the pattern of different animals? Apparently. Going back to the scene itself, and how awesome that chase is, especially when they make it to Tiny Town. Oh, yes. Because you're like, Whoa! They really thought this out! And I love how she grabs the donut, saves her, but also uses it to catch the weasel. Yes. And is it just me, or did that donut look a lot like the big donut from Steven Universe? Well, it's kind of the generic standard donut for a TV slash movie donut shop, but still. Yeah. Well, I can see that, especially since we watched Steven Universe recently. Oh yeah, and she's getting punished in the office. And Mrs. Emerton makes her way past uh, Clausen at the front desk to appeal to the chief. And Judy is like, I will do this. And speaking of things to go back to talk on real quick, when I first watched this movie, that scene where they first go to Zootopia, where she's riding on the train, that is gorgeous. And the way they shoot it, you actually feel like you're on the train. You feel like the camera's following the train. You actually feel the motion of the train. 
which I completely forgot about. And then I remembered that scene after Ember watched. I was like, are you okay? Because I get very severe motion sickness. I can be the driver and still get motion sickness. So, yeah. Oh, but that scene was beautiful. But jumping back to the scene we were just in, this might be a good opportunity to say what you were spoiled about. Yes. So specifically what I was spoiled about, I was not spoiled about the cause, but I was spoiled that the predators were going savage and who was behind the drug. That's the part that made her sour on the movie for so long. It's a bummer because it's actually really a minor it's not the major plot point of the movie. No, it's like in the last 30 minutes. 35 minutes. What's really nice about that, though, is they actually leave clues in the beginning of the movie to who the main bad guy is. Because you see how taken advantage of Bellwether is and how ignored by Lionheart, that's a classic story trope for this is actually the villain. Also, there's things in her office that actually point to the people later in the movie who she calls up and talks to on the train that eventually goes out of control. Another awesome train scene. Yeah, so there's pictures of at least one of the Rams. But back to Nick and Judy and just how they play off of each other. Those two actors nail those characters. Oh, Ember just took it somewhere naughty. <laughs> I'm like, you do realize we're talking about Zootopia. The door is wide open. Speaking of which, I love how some of my friends were like, is Disney trying to say something with this song? Try everything. <laughs> my friends also happen to be furries, so. <laughs> yes, it's like, so we have this beautiful gazelle singing about how you should try everything, surrounded by four very muscular tiger dancers. And there's apparently an app out there where you can put your own head on one of these dancers. Yes, yes. Well, that's another thing that just makes it so real is Gazelle is a huge star in this world. And that's very much fanboy slash girl behavior. Oh, and that reminds me of a wonderful character in this movie. That tiger at the... I'm pretty sure he's a tiger, right? Leopard? Cheetah? Yeah. Cougar? <laughs> He's a spotted cat, so that means a cheetah or a leopard. I think he's a leopard. It'd be funnier for him to be a cheetah because of his weight issues. But he's one of my favorite characters. He's just so big and fluffy and lovable. He is like the most gentle predator. I love how you got a little something right here. He goes, oh, that's where you are. I'd be like, that was another point in the movie where I'm like, <laughs> Um, you. Though if you pay attention real closely, there was an animation oops in that scene because before Judy points it out, there's nothing there. And then once she points it out, it's conveniently there. But yeah, he's like the most lovable thing. You just want to like, is it okay in your culture if I pet you on the head? Because, dude. <laughs> wow. You're just the cutest thing ever. It's not okay for me to say. I know it's not okay for me to say that about you, Bunny. But hey. <laughs> And that's another thing is they bring up all these different social mores for different animal species. Like, bunny can call another bunny cute. A cat can't really call a bunny cute. And also when Nick and Judy are with Bellwether accessing the computer system. Nick, stop. What? Sheep never let me get this close. You don't just touch a sheep's wool. <laughs> Does she count herself? <laughs> <laughs> yes, another one of those uh, lightly handled animal jokes. It's just the way they handle everything in this movie. Oh, I need to double check my statistics, but if I remember correctly, this movie did way better than Moana, which is the one Disney was actually betting on. Disney was like, Moana is going to be the big hit. Where the heck did this come from? Yeah, you can't always predict the market, but it's fun looking at the scene where they get back to uh, Duke Weaselton and you get to look at those DVDs because he goes, I have movies that aren't even out yet. And they show Moana, Frozen 2, and in between those two is another movie, I believe it started with G, I might have been gigantic, and it has a character in red on a green background. Moana we know about. Everyone and their dog has been asking for Frozen 2. Mm -hmm, which apparently is now in production, and apparently there's also Big Hero 6-2. I don't know if that was actually one of the DVDs, but that's also 
at least in the script writing phase, while they work on the TV series. Yeah, Big Hero 6 was in there, but it was specifically those three movies that are shown when Duke Weaselton says, I have movies that aren't even out yet. Moana, Frozen 2, and that one in the middle. But Big Hero 6 is there as Pig Hero 6. There's also uh, Wreck-It Ralph and Tangled. Which reminds me, there is a sequel coming out for Wreck-It Ralph as well. More importantly, the voice actor for the weasel is the voice actor of the Duke of Wesselton in Frozen. There is so much talent in this movie. It's crazy. Yeah. And the only thing, I love the scenes with Mr. Big. It really, it's like, Judy, you're, you're a really good person. You're blackmailing Nick to get his assistance, and then you're using the assistance of a mob boss to get information from a bootleg street seller. They made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Money. <laughs> yeah, which was awesome, you know, because they were playing so much with Mr. Big, the classic godfather, and to fit that phrase in, the offer you can't refuse, and, you know, usually that's something... Very complicated, like, I'm going to give you this really awesome thing, or I'm going to take away this thing that's very precious to you. But money. Money is a huge motivator for a large portion of people. It's kind of why we have jobs. And there's a lot of attention to detail on the animations for characters as well. How they move works with what type of animal they are as well. Like how Judy's ears are a good emotional signal and can tell where she's looking. I didn't say listening because her eyes actually move the same way her ears do too. Because her eyes look at the same time her ears go. Bloop. It's kind of like when you pay attention to a cat. If you pay attention to them, they actually look with their ears as well. Because they can be looking straight at you, but you'll notice their ears will turn backwards sometimes. That's not because they're getting angry at you. That's because they're listening to something behind them. And they're like, hmm, need to keep an eye on that. But right now I'm paying attention to you. And then suddenly they turn away from you. That's because the sound behind them either got more interesting or more disturbing. And just how slowly Nick learns to appreciate and respect Judy to the point where he defends her in that awesome scene after the limo driver yes. gets shot and goes berserk. Because, come on, we're talking about Nick Slick standing up to the cops for a rabbit. And he uses his smarts to go, hey, wait a minute, you're breaking your own deal here. She has 10 hours left. <laughs> I think it was 10 hours, I can't remember. It was 10 hours. He's like, uh, no. What did you say? I mean, no, she's not going to give you the badge right now. She's been on this case for just a few hours, you know, with this rinky-dink little cart and a neon vest, and she hasn't cracked a case that all of you couldn't crack in two weeks. No wonder she had to enlist a fox. Dig, dig, dig. Also, she has, yeah, 10 hours left, so we'll be going now. I also love how Judy uses her knowledge that she gains through watching the other animals to get into the facility. No, 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 you're gonna start everyone else, Holly! <laughs> yeah, because whatever Nick was indicating with his gesturing before he took off without Judy, no clue, and definitely wasn't what Judy actually did. That was awesome. It made me remember this great meme. Sign gets posted to the ground. No wooing allowed. $10,000 fine. <laughs> and how they get out, too. Ugh. Yes, yes, but definitely beat being caught. Also, just briefly, uh, Nick's flashback defining childhood moment. Ow. Yeah, and that was from Prey, the nice people. Yeah, from the ones who are supposedly gentle and don't have these killer instincts. Yeah. I'm like, you guys are... Ooh, I didn't give you such a binge! So pointing out that it isn't species that matters, it's individuals. Because they were just as much jerks to Nick as Gideon was to Judy and her lamb friends. Another moment is, I think it's after they get flushed out, shows a change in Nick's perception as well when he goes from calling her carrots to saying Judy when he's worried about her. That's another nice moment you can put in the script to show that a character is starting to care about a particular individual when they've been using a nickname for most of the movie, then suddenly switch over to their real name. The only thing, though, is 
Judy had her cell phone on her when they were in the facility. Why the heck wasn't she recording? Wasn't there some recording? Because I remember her putting her cell phone in a Ziploc bag so it would be safe on the way out. She did do that. But I'm not sure she got much recording. Also, just in terms of audio, again, the handy dandy pen would have been useful while they were hiding. I love the way they use that pen. The setup, the payoff, the setup, and payoff. Mm-hmm. Ah, uh, let's see. What's the next scene we should talk about at that point? You have a better chronological view of the movie than I do. I know, I know, but we have to go backwards a little bit because we didn't spend enough time on the mob boss. Because... <sighs> I'm sorry, Mr. Biggs. I, I didn't mean to do that with your... <laughs> like, I told you never to come back here. Well, technically, we were brought here against our will, so this wasn't my choice. Like, what did you repay me with, Nick? A rug made from the butt of a skunk. A skunk butt rug. You dishonored me. You dishonored my grandmother. <laughs> uh... I, I would like to ask a little bit of how textiles work in this world. So was skunk fur obtained via like a hairbrush? Or is taxidermy a thing in this universe? Yeah, and how does it work? Because not to gross anyone out or anything, but there are actual human skin and stuff like that has been turned into books and things like that. Most of what I know is of murderers that got experimented on and people wanted mo mo mementos. But is that like how it worked in Zootopia? Yeah, and also there have been some that have been preserved scientifically with the person's permission granted while they were alive. And those items have made tours of museums. They were not really products made from but it was still the preserved form. But just Judy's in with Mr. Big. It's just instantaneous. It's like, okay, so you're a good cop, but you have an in with the dark underworld. In a very good note. And she handles it so well. She's hanging there, about ready to be dumped into plunging freezing cold ice water and die from hypothermia, freezing, Drowning, whichever happens first. Dad, I told you not to kill anyone on my wedding day. Hey, this is the rabbit who saved my life yesterday. You know, from the big donuts. Love your dress. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, okay, you did me this kindness. I will repay your kindness I will, and pay it forward. And then they come back, and not only is he still pleased with her, Judy's now going to be the godmother of his grandchild. Also, I wanted to talk more about the scenes with Mr. Big because I'm like, how do we manage to fit how much of this stuff into children's movies? The polar bear crossed himself. Hmm, interesting. Also, Judy's parents used the word devil more than once. Hmm. They managed to skip God, both Judy's parents and Judy, but Judy's parents used devil on multiple occasions. Hmm, I think it's more about context nowadays. Probably. But there's not a lot of different context for crossing yourself. Yeah. Well, that may be okay, especially since it's a Disney movie and they've used a lot of religious symbolism in the past. Hunchback of Notre Dame or Notre Dame. Which was kind of an underdog film for them and very much a deviation for them because that's pretty dark for Disney. Not that Disney isn't always dark, but dark in a different way because it tackled religion and the righteousness of man and, you know, damnation. And we're getting off topic. Which is perfectly fine. Especially when we're having fun. But wow, just everything so far. But the most cringeworthy part for me was Judy's press conference. I had to pause for a good 10, 15 minutes because I knew exactly how that was going to play out. And when I say exactly, I mean, right down to the point where Nick had actually filled out the application exactly. Ah, I didn't predict that so far. I knew she was going to mess up, and it was technically going to be Nick's fault because he coached her a little bit, and I knew Nick was going to go and leave. So that part was pretty painful. And then you have the continuing attacks as Bellwether targets more 
predators, you have the fear factor, you have Clausen getting moved down to records because they didn't want a predator to be at reception, you have Gazelle holding a peace rally, though I'm guessing Bellwether must be a Gazelle fan because hitting one of Gazelle's tigers during that rally would have been huge for her cause. Though saying Gazelle reminds me of the fact that you have that app too? That was a wonderful moment. Yes, yes, fandom is everywhere. <laughs> the moment we're talking about is the one where Clausen comes into the boss's office to say something, I'm not quite sure what, and catches the bull using the app. He goes, I'm not using it. <laughs> uh, though a particular scene we accidentally skipped over, one of my favorites, and it's partially in the trailers. I laughed at the trailers. And I laughed at this scene when I saw it again in the movie. The DMV scene. It was awesome. The setup, the payoff, the... You wanna hear a joke? No, no, no! <laughs> <laughs> sure, Flash. <laughs> you, you do that so well. <laughs> uh, flash, flash, 100 yard dash. <laughs> And we can't do every scene in the movie, but since you doubled back to the DMVs, should we double back to the naturalists? Oh, wow. How did we forget about that? That is awesome. Poor <laughs> Judy. Also, they're actually mislabeled in the movie. They're nudists, but apparently they prefer to be called naturalists. So, but still, that's another one of those great areas where they slipped in an animal pun. And you haven't realized it, but they also reverse it. Elephants with awesome memories. No, no, it's the llamas. <laughs> yeah. Dude. Yeah, when, when they first went to this place, I figured it was going to be a drug den. <laughs> also, apparently this scene caused some awkwardness for some parents. I've spoken with other people now that I've seen the movie. And they were like, yeah, that scene was kind of awkward because my kids were like, did she just say naked? <laughs> Moving on to any other points we may have missed that you wanted to go over. Yeah, well, the Natural History Museum. You look at all of that, and when you have Bellwether, Judy, and Nick, and they first come across each other, in the background is a painting of a predator being hunted by jackalopes. Huh. And the really interesting thing there is the predator is down on all fours like a predator, but the jackalopes, both in the painting and the one that Nick uses to fool the ram in the form of a statue are anthro. Hmm, interesting. Yes, because that kind of implies that the prey evolved first. Possible, but in my head, the predator would go first. I would think so too, but just that layout, because the jackalopes are using tools and standing upright, and the black leopard... Yes, most people call them panthers, but it is a black leopard. In the painting, is down on all fours, like a standard predator. The real question is, since it seems to be prey that's the dominant in this society in some way, maybe it's a prey image, meaning the prey made it and they wanted to put down the predator. Entirely possible. The thing is, prey outnumbers the predators. But the predators seem to be more in charge. Because you hear Bellwether go, sure, they're big, they're powerful, but they're only 10%. Hmm. You can be a small percentage and be in charge. But it makes me wonder, it's like, did the evolution that's mentioned in Judy's shortcut storyline of, yes, it used to be like this, but now it's like this, through the magic of storytelling, did evolution occurs simultaneously did the prey evolve faster because it's the prey that had to survive you know mm. the prey has to work harder to get away then the predator has to work harder to catch it i mean we see predators eating fruits and vegetables in this but they kind of skip over how species that are biologically designed to eat meat evolved into vegetarians I mean, many predators are omnivorous, but they still, you know, high-protein diet. 
and there are some components that are very difficult to come by in a completely vegetarian diet. Yeah, though I've been hearing recently that you can get the proteins you need from a completely vegetarian diet if you know what plants to go for, though they have to be rare plants from what I understand. So Yes, it's not easy to complete the full protein profile on a plant-based diet. It can be done, but it can't be done casually. Oh, and weren't you going to talk about Flash at the end of the movie? Yeah, yeah, that was um, something I wanted to touch on regarding Flash at the end of the movie being the speeding roadster. I have to wonder, did they do that just as a joke after showing how slow the sloths move? Or is Flash speeding on accident? We don't see the sloths have a very quick reaction time. Is he pressing down on the pedal and not being able to let up in time and misjudging the speed? I love that scene as well. It was so great because I love their truck. Jesus Christ, Mini Judy, when you like got department funding, you got you got a monster. <laughs> also, that wonderful line, you know you love me. Do I know you? I love you. Yes, yes I do. Uh, and back to Flash, Flash, 100 Yard Dash. Hi, Nick. And just the smile in Flash's voice. Uh, the smile is ma what makes me question, was he doing it accidentally? But when we see how slowly the sloths moved at the DMV, which they seem to be saying was a biological function, how does he have reaction time fast enough to do that? Because even when he and Priscilla are shown dancing at the concert, they're moving slower. Yeah, also with the fact that the car he's driving. <laughs> oh, yeah. Any other points you'd like to go over real quick, or should we just go to our outro? Let's just go to the outro, and then people can tell us in the comments that we skipped their favorite scene. <laughs> Uh, which is perfectly fine. We like comments like that. And we'll eventually reply to him, probably Ember more than me. I don't mean to skip comments. I just get busy with everything. But all right then, outro. And this has been our thoughts on Disney's Zootopia. Yes, finally. Oh, hi. Um, You stayed around after the credits? Yeah, I like that kind of style, because, you know, that's where you get all the spoilers. Okay, so here's the secret. We have a lot more programming. And if you want to see the new ones as they come out, you can click that subscribe button. Don't forget to ring the bell. Also, if you write something in the comments, we'll probably write back to you. <gasps> Amazing! And I know you've been staring at Lux draw this pretty picture this whole time. He has more art online. Isn't that amazing? I've never seen so much art and it's so pretty. Tumblr, Twitter, DeviantArt, Google+, Facebook, Mastodon, Reddit, probably more places I haven't listed and more places as we find them. It's all on the internet. Look how big this is. Really like Lux's art and want some of your own? Here's the big secret. He takes commissions. <gasps> Check the link for pricing and availability. Availability is subject to change. You know, there's this thing called life, and it's not just a board game. Oh, um, yeah, there are two other Easter eggs, but they require money to unlock. So the first one is Patreon. That starts out at a dollar and gets you a monthly quick sketch with the ability to suggest and vote on future monthly quick sketches. The other one, well, pricier, less pricey. Higher starting costs, but no ongoing commitment. Coffee works in $3 increments. Single time donation, you just have to work in increments of three, have a PayPal account, and you kind of get a thank you message for that one. So that's kind of like a prize, right? Thanks again for listening.